whether you call it Alice's Adventures Underground or Through the Looking Glass or Alice's Adventures in Wonderland or just Alice, Lewis Carroll's work is among the top five in the Western world's literature canon. That's the most recognized, the most um, uh, ref referenced uh, through allusion. One of the most universally known, if not loved always, works in our literature. Here are the top five, Shakespeare, and then major authors or cultural figures especially regionally. For example, um, Gabriel Garcia Marquez in Colombia, everyone will know him, even if they've not read him. Uh, third is the um, Bible, widely known, many languages. Fourth is mythology. And that is waning a bit as um, more recent generations have grown less affectionate of the stars and the stories that explain them. But fifth is Alice. Alice Through the Looking Glass, Alice's Adventures Underground, Alice in Wonderland. When Charles Dodson, who became known as Lewis Carroll, wrote this um, and gifted it to Alice Little in 1863, he created, probably deliberately, um, or at least hoped to create deliberately, uh, something that would become the, the chief jewel in the diadem that was the Victorian era's cult of the child. It was Alice. And I will show you um, pictures of young Alice. She is this lass. She had two sisters. And this is the young Alice Little. This is the picture that is at the end of our manuscript, uh, our original manuscript of Alice's Adventures Underground, which later became Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. It was taken from a fairly rare photo of young Alice Little. Alice's father um, was a professor of mathematics at Oxford University, and that's where Charles uh, Dodson or Lewis Carroll taught. And he was a friend of the families, was mentored by them, mentored them. And he wrote this story um, for Alice, her sister, and another sister not in this photo when they were on an outing. Young Alice asked for a copy and the rest truly is history. This is a picture of Alice Little Hargreaves when she was receiving a, a, an honorary doctorate in our country um, at Columbia University. I'll show you now a photo of the manuscript itself. This is what Alice received one Christmas after Dodson had written it at her request. The original manuscript of this is all in his hand and all of the sketches, all of the drawings are his. And you'll notice they're not the ones that um, those of us familiar with this work see most frequently, those of um, Tenniel. Instead, this is, this is Lewis Carroll himself. And you'll see down here at the bottom that this manuscript was purchased by a Philadelphia philanthropist and literary correct collector for the sum of $75,000, which is uh, significantly less than the manuscript is worth. What is interesting here is that we see how an adventure begins. We see how it begins uh, for the Victorian age. We see how it begins for Alice herself. And we hear um, from the very beginning that she was beginning to get very tired of sitting by her sister on the bank and of having nothing to do. Once or twice she had peeped into the book her sister was reading, but it had no pictures or conversations in it. And where is the use of a book, thought Alice, without pictures or conversation? So of course what happens is that Lewis Carroll gives Alice plenty of pictures, plenty of conversation, through the story that he creates and then writes for her. A rabbit runs by. A white rabbit with pink eyes ran close by her. And there was nothing very remarkable in that. But then again, when he started speaking, dear, dear, I shall be too late. Alice thought perhaps this was something unusual. What she does is watch him dive underground into a hole. And then we're told in a single sentence, without further ado, 
Alice went after him, not giving a thought to how she would ever get back out again. And that's our Alice. This particular manuscript was something that Great Britain really longed to have, but couldn't afford. So I have here, um, it's a, an advertisement from the Cleveland Plain Dealer, August 4th, 1946. A tad fragile, but it was tucked into a book, um, an Alice book that I purchased in an antique shop decades ago. But this is something that appeared throughout our country. Uh, and here's what it said. If sufficient money can be raised, $50,000 50, is the sum requested. The original manuscript of Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland is to be retrieved from the book dealer who owns it and to end its somewhat perambulatory existence safe in the archives of the British Museum. Luther Evans, who's the Librarian of Congress, has started a campaign to bring this about and is soliciting wealthy book collectors to do their duty and kick in. Well, America did its duty, it kicked in, at least 20 of the wealthy book collectors did. And for $50,000, this book was bought from its owner, original owner, and it was gifted to the British Museum. And that's where you have to go now to see it. Um, fortunately, from my own perspective, we refused to give back Winnie the Pooh and the original animals that came um, with, uh, with Shepherd's book. They can be seen in the New York Public Library and it's open now. But if you wanna see Alice, you have to go to the British Library and she is revered. She is in their treasure room. Um, this manuscript is, is quite something. I mentioned that uh, it really marks the Victorian age's cult of the child. And that was such a, such a change from what uh, England and certainly the United States, um, which we had become by then, and much of the world thought was appropriate for children's literature. Until this, we had children's literature that was designed to teach children how to be really proper small adults. So it focused on uh, didactic literature. These are the things I want you to know so you can grow up and be just like me. It focused on uh, genteel literature. This is how I think you should behave so that you can grow up and be just like me. And then uh, additionally, it focused on cautionary tales. This is what you need to do to stay alive so that you can grow up to be just like me. And when uh, Lewis Carroll wrote, he threw all of this out the window. The cult of the child believed that instead of focusing on original sin, which our own puritanical, um, our own Puritan writers focused on so, um, so effectively, in this country and, and before um, in the UK. Instead of focusing on original sin and how to get better, how to save yourself, um, how to stay alive, Dodson thought that children had original perfection. And he felt that that meant you don't need to teach them how to be genteel or teach them uh, pretty much anything that you think would make them like you. And they'll figure out how to stay alive um, if you just feed them and uh, clothe them periodically. So his three hallmarks for this, this wonderful piece of literature are that he is anti-didactic, he is anti-cautionary, and he's very anti-genteel, um, as the Tea Party has shown us all. I'm going to share um, some quotes out of myriad quotations from this work that really put in uh, uh, Lewis Carroll's jibes and jabs at the way literature had been for children. Here's one that's anti-cautionary. Now remember, he as a child would have had all sorts of cautionary tales about um, the horrible things that happen to people who play with matches or who inadvertently sin by falling asleep in church. It was all very well to say, drink me, but the wise little Alice was not gonna do that in a hurry. No, I'll look first, she said, it's a smart kid, and see whether it's marked poison or not. For she had read several nice little stories about children who had got burnt or eaten up by wild beasts and other unpleasant things, all because they would not remember simple rules such as, you know, if you drink too much from a bottle marked poison, it is almost certain to disagree with you sooner or later. 
so many other times um, does she throw caution to the wind. And that certainly happened when she jumped on that rabbit hole uh, from the very beginning. This is anti-cautionary. Here are some examples of anti-didactic. And remember, this is a didact. Um, Lewis Carroll himself is a mathematician uh, who teaches some rather, um, rather complex things at Oxford in his time, um, but that's not for Alice. The Duchess, who, quote, befriends, unquote, Alice, says to her, everything's got a moral, if only you can find it. Everything had to have a moral in the literature that was written for children heretofore. Uh, it taught you not to play with matches. It taught you not to talk in church. It taught you to, to pray as much as you possibly could to avoid um, burning in hell uh, if you forgot to pray. There are, are I, it sounds like I'm exaggerating, I'm not. There are so many stories that were designed for children to behave like adults. Hopefully adults have been changed by Alice's adventures as well. Here's another anti-didactic. This is uh, said by the mock turtle, who in fact has the head of a calf and the body of a tortoise. He says, this is what we're taught in school, reeling and writhing, and the different branches of arithmetic, ambition, distraction, uglification, and derision. Just one of my favorite examples of how anti-didactic this book is. And finally, genteel. Just read the part about the, the tea party. Um, it's extraordinary. But here's one quote um, that gives you an idea of how the, the manners that Alice brought to the table were no better than the manners um, the table uh, provided. The hare and the, um, the hatter say, have some wine. Alice says, I don't see any wine. And they say, well, there isn't any. And then Alice responds and says, then it wasn't very civil of you to offer it. And they respond, it wasn't very civil of you to sit down without being invited. So while this is uh, something that explodes on the scene of Victorian England, England had also become, uh, with, with um, no small thanks to Victoria and her husband and their very large family, uh, a very family-centered country. Suddenly children, if you had leisure, and not everybody did, if you had leisure time, children became a focus. We saw pictures of Victoria and Alfred um, Albert sitting around and reading to their children, playing games with their children. We don't know if that was done just for the photographs, but the, the public loved the idea of spending time with children and children began to be idolized and idealized. And hence, you've got uh, a writer here who says, no more original sin, done with that. We want original perfection. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna write it. So I'd like to show you some of the photos of uh, original drawings that were in the original manuscript. You've got here the Queen of Hearts who made some tarts. This is, this is drawn for us um, in the original manuscript by Lewis Carroll. One of the things that you find interesting when you see the interaction between Alice and the quote adults unquote in this book, there are a lot of fists and there's always quite a size difference, isn't there? Here we're a bit more equitable, but there's that fist again. She's trying very hard to be polite, as best as Alice can, in the middle of this crazy dream. This particular um, example of the tea party is by Tenniel, the uh, later illustrator, once this was published two years later in 1865. He was called a mad hatter, by the way, because hatters themselves worked with mercury in the felt they used to create hats, and it often uh, affected their mental facilities. The hare, also called mad, um, we're told by uh, the Cheshire cat, the hare was mad because in March it was assumed that hares went mad because of the mating season. And that's where, um, that's where we got that. Madness also comes out for us in the interaction that Alice has with the cat. And if you remember the books or even the films, you remember that the cat just appears as a big smile in the tree the Cheshire cat. 
And Alice is looking for directions. She's looking for directions to get out or get in. She's not always clear about that. And the um, cat tells her, the Cheshire cat, well, if you go that way, you'll get to the March Hare. He's mad. If you go that way, you'll get to the Mad Hatter. He's mad. And Alice understandably says, you know, I don't want to spend, she puts it, I don't want to be among mad people. And then our cat responds, well, we're all mad here. I'm mad, you're mad. And Alice doesn't have a strong retort to that. So one of the things that we see a great deal of when we look at um, the theme of madness in this work is, is the question of what is sane, what is mad? Who are you and who am I in this whole world of sanity and insanity? What's real, what's not real, um, what's surreal? And uh, there is this, this sense that um, we're all mad here in a sense answers qu uh, questions that pepper this entire work, chief of which is who am I? And one of um, Alice's more famous lines, and she has many, is who am I? Who in this world am I? That is the grand puzzle. And she finds that out or doesn't find it out as she walks through this adventure in, in uh, this incredible place. Other things here, in addition to the questions and the madness, you do have, of course, surrealism. And, and no one is as good at that, I think, as Lewis Carroll, as he puts the calf's head on the tortoise's body or the griffin's head on the lion's body, um, as he has a caterpillar who sits on top of a mushroom. Let me give you those. And smokes a hookah with a very little girl looking up. Who is, who is herself, smaller than the flowers. Size is a major theme in Alice's Adventures Underground or Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. And it's size in relation to power. When the Duchess told Alice that everything had a moral, one of the things you see um, and Alice comments on is that the Duchess has a very pointed chin and it's digging into Alice's shoulder. And Alice says, uh, you know, what is the moral of that story? Because remember, all stories have to have a moral uh, in the world preceding Alice's uh, Adventures in Wonderland. And the, and the Duchess says, tut, tut, everything has a moral if you can only find it. But she's larger than Alice and she's, she's rather pushing her shoulder down. You again see the size differential when you look at our queen. Queen Victoria and Charles Dodson, now we know him as Lewis Carroll, were really had, they reigned in England at about the same time. They spanned that entire century, uh, that entire wonderful uh, century. And Victoria was said to have really liked this work. Victoria seems to be part of this work visually, at least many people thought so. Uh, Victoria herself was solid, um, stalwart, maybe a tad stout. And the queen is as well. Um, she is equally stout, um, almost, uh, equally stolid, equally stalwart, but perhaps a little bit angrier than Victoria, one hopes so. Uh, they are both very, very imperial. And let, uh, with that finger, uh, let Alice know that her head can be cut off before she has a time, a chance to even say what her name is. So size is, is, is important here. One of the other things that we see is that Alice grows. She does, um, as Jefferson Airplane says, you know, one pill makes you smaller, the other makes you taller. Um, Alice has all the answers. You can talk to the hookah smoking caterpillar. Alice has fought with her size in comparison to all the creatures in Wonderland throughout the stream. But in the end, um, she is in yet another instance of mock gentility, um, anti-gentility, when she's in the Queen's court. And we're trying to find out who stole those tarts. The Queen, of course, uh, contrary to what we all hope would be justice, says, verdict first off with his head and then we'll go ahead and we'll deal with 
the sentence. Then we'll find out what the evidence is. But first I want him killed. And Alice, Alice and even the king um, suggest that maybe this isn't a great idea. But the ruckus that ensues ensues because Alice is coming into her own. She grows. She grows physically, she grows socially, she speaks out, she stands up, she wakes up, and we end the story. Uh, and we end it with Alice coming back out of a dream and bringing some of that dream into the real world, if that's what it is, because she's still thinking of all of the characters she met, right? Uh, and she's hearing the farm noise become what she thought was in the courtroom. And she's seeing her sister still reading in this shady nook. A little bit earlier, this is what she said to us. And I will, I will read this quote. I almost wish I hadn't gone down the rabbit hole. And yet, you know, and yet it's rather curious, you know, this sort of life. I do wonder what can have happened to me. When I used to read fairy tales, I fancied that kind of thing never happened. And now here I am in the middle of one. There ought to be a book written about me. That there ought. And that, that there was. <laughs>